the kind, more like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different life. Welcome back to another special edition of Hard Knock Life. I'm your host, Keith Chow, another special special presentation uh, with our favorite nerd of color on the internet. You know her as an award-winning director of such classic films as Punisher Warzone, which is on uh, IFC On Demand, I believe, right now. So go check that out. Also, Green Street Hooligans. She's uh, been nominated for Oscars, believe it or not. Even they, they used to actually nominate people who weren't white in the past. And uh, now she's a, an acclaimed television director for shows such as Arrow and upcoming Supergirl, which we are all excited for. Welcome back to Hard Knock Life, our favorite director, Lexi Alexander. You know my favorite podcast, Nerds of Color, my people. Thank you. Oh, see, you, do you hear that? Nerds of Color, Hard Knock Life, Lexi Alexander's favorite podcast. We're going to put that in No, quotes. it's true. That I mean, I'm telling everybody. It goes even above my, my very famous one, uh, How Did This Get Made? Because I feel like, you know, Nerds of Color are my people. And, and you are our people, so uh, enough of the love fest. Let's get to talking about the yeah. real things. Uh, well, one of the things I wanted to just off the bat, last time we talked, uh, it was around the time that you were uh, directing Arrow on the CW, and and we just happened to be talking again right before your episode of Supergirl airs on CBS. So you are well-versed in the, uh, we, we like to call it the Berlanti-verse, the Greg Berlanti, Andrew Kreisberg uh, universe of superhero shows. So... Can you quickly talk about um, how you went from Arrow to Supergirl and, and what we have in store? Because I'm a huge fan of the show, and when I found out you were directing it, it was just like mind blown. So can you talk a little bit about your episode and then how you came to Supergirl? I remember you were live tweeting with me my Arrow episode, which was a big deal for me because that really was my first TV gig. And I mean, I was touched beyond belief that so many people showed up and live tweeted you know, that did, didn't even watch the show, just live tweeted because, you know, I, 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 I was directing. And so it was a big, big event for me. And, you know, I think the, the, sh the episode was fairly popular. I mean, you know, the, the showrunners really liked it. That's what they've told me. And Andrew Kreisberg was tweeting with me and may, it had like, a, you know, just gave me a compliment. And I think that Supergirl either premiered the night before or one of the first episodes had just premiered the night before. And um, I tweeted a little joke back, you know, knowing actually that they were all booked for what episodes were safe. I didn't even know that they were considering a back 10 or back 12 or whatever mm. uh, they got. And so I tweeted a little joke when he complimented me and said, we have to have you back. I said, well, how about up, up and, uh, and away? And so mm. he... He took that and and the very next day checked my availability for Supergirl. So it was what, like one of those amazing stories that I could talk about forever because it was really kind of a Twitter thing. I was being fairly forward and fresh and he kind of went with it and said, yeah, I mean, like it's the logical choice for Supergirl. So it was really a great occasion. I'm... I'm more than excited for the episode that that airs on monday night and one of the things that i think uh, like you were talking about it's a perfect kind of combination is that supergirl is one of the few you know female-led superhero live action uh properties that are that are that's on i mean it's funny too that like television seems to be the only place where we can get like female superheroes having their own show and supergirl being probably you know, the biggest of them all, just because of the, the, the reach that it has being on a broadcast uh, network like CBS. And what I also appreciate about the show, too, is that it's one of the showrunners is a woman. You know, three out of the four lead characters are women. So, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, you're, you're, you're a big proponent for gender equality and empowerment. And how does, how does it feel to be a part of such, a, such an iconic character story? It's unbelievable. My whole experience, it was, um, it was probably the best experience I had since I've been in in the film industry at all. Like, I mean, you know, there was a real appreciation about me being also a director who came from being a stunt woman and a female fighting champion. So everybody was super excited. Everybody said, whatever you can bring to the table, please bring to the table. So when, you know, when there was a fight scene written, I, I looked at the choreography and I, you know, which I wouldn't usually do on another show because it's a touchy thing. You can't just as a director come in and like nix the whole, chore, you know, choreography. But in this case, I knew that Andrew had great faith in me and had told me several times 
you know, the stunt coordinator, uh, John Medlin, was, you know, started with the same stunt choreographer I started. Pat Johnson basically both made our careers. So I was in a, in a safe place. And I ended up writing, like, can I change this? I really would like to change this. Here's what I would like to do. And, you know, they, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily like, oh, yeah, for sure, whatever. Like, it was really kind of a, a step that I was taking. And they all had a discussion and said, look, I think we, we think you're the perfect person to take her fighting style to the next level. And Melissa was told that as well. So she was excited when I got there and said, so this is going to be a slightly different than usual. Like, we're not only going to to rely on your superpowers because you're getting to the place where you don't only win fights with your superpowers, you win it based on also your fighting skills. And, um, you know, the end result was um, that Andrew Kreisberg now tells people that I basically established a fighting style that they will be from now on using mm. as a basis. Like, it's, it's, it's not only done something for an episode, but it's done something for the show. And, you know, that's as awesome as it gets like my dream is to at some point you know get to direct some of the pilots where you can establish styles and right. tone um so you don't usually in episode 14 or something you don't get to do that but they let me do that because they had great faith and not only that like he andrew actually showed up on the day of the fighting scene and made sure he like told the entire crew said, you know, make sure that Lexi gets what she wants because that's why I hired this Avenger over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, it sets a kind of tone for the rest of the crew to kind of say, oh, you know, the showrunner, you know, believes in this person. And, you know, as you know, we often talk about diversity and I always say it's not just about hiring diverse people, it's about inclusion. It's about can you create an environment that actually lets the diverse people succeed? Because we always have, you know, with with their, with us having like a very small percentage in representation, there's always a, a bias, a, a little bit of doubt. Like, mm. is, are they not getting hired because we're just simply not good enough, you know? And so by having a showrunner who is that important and that well known and who really calls the shots on show, show up and say, you know, this is why I hired her, you know, it kind of gives this this stamp of trust, like you work under completely different conditions than, than when you're just being thrown into an environment where, you know, people kind of like, who the heck is this? Is this right, the affirmative right. action hire, you know? It's interesting what you say about, you know, television directing it being, you know, it's a different animal from film directing because, because like you said, especially coming on to a long standing series, you, you, you have to pay attention to this, the tone that's already been set by previous directors and, and what the screenwriter, uh, I'm sorry, what the showwriters have, have established. One of the cool things though about Supergirl is that, you know, it's still in its first season and like, like you yeah. said, you, you, you can still kind of mold, mold it a little bit, right? You know, I mean, I, I had a great time on Arrow and I will always be grateful about that. But being in a first season show and be, uh, it being a female superhero, where they still trying to figure out how strong is she and what is a strong woman and what is a what is a strong you know female superhero one of the yeah. tweets that you sent out while you were filming yeah. and you were talking about the fight scene was this awesome photo that you sent out of you and and uh yeah. um melissa can you talk a little bit about about the the girl power behind this uh the, behind this photo and and Oh. Yeah, you know, this was actually funny because it, it, not a lot of people know. It, it's interesting. Sometimes in America, you get in a little bit of trouble because, you know, I don't think history is taught as well here as it should be. And so people thought I had taken a Black Panda greeting, you know, and mm. and and I, I actually got a little bit of grief for that. But of course, I know the history of the raised fist, which goes back to Assyrian times, you know, mm. and it goes back to beyond, beyond, you know, before the Bible. And not only that, what actually is much more famous about the raised fist is this Mexican uh, printing shop in the 40s, which I'm dying for somebody to do a TV show about because there were these, in the 40s, there was this Mexican printing shop that basically used logos um, for social causes. And mm -hmm. just this group of artists who was just this really hip group, and they brought the raised fist back. 
and then only later on it got used by Black Panther. So when you do the raised fist, you can't really say you're appropriating, you know, a, a black culture thing because it's a symbol of, you know, empowerment. And so I thought this was a great photo for us to take because also on that day I had tweeted that this was the first time in my entire career of choreographing and directing so many fights that I was able to choreograph and direct a fight with a female superhero. That has never happened in my career. Of all the Queen Street and Punisher and Lifted and all of those things, it, I just never worked with a female lead. And so it was a special occasion for me, for her, for everybody involved. And, um, you know, it was very, very, it, it, it went until I think the 19th of December before everybody went on Christmas break at 5 a.m. We were finally done with that scene. Can you mm -hmm. imagine? Like we were dead, like we will, and they had gone an entire season. And so here we stood with this photo. And then I think what was really incredibly neat about it, which I think you just had up as well is, Something I hadn't even realized is that my friend Saladin Ahmed mm -hmm. um, noticed that I had worn my uh, kafir, which is a basically a Palestinian scarf. And, you know, I, w I wasn't doing that consciously. It's something I wear when I'm cold under, you know. <laughs> and, but here I was, and I am an Arab woman, and here I was directing Supergirl in a fight scene and it was uh, it was as he said an incredibly important moment in american pop culture you know yeah i actually hadn't realized that you you there was some pushback um because i, I think i did see saladin's tweet and that in fact i think saladin's tweet is the one that came up in my feed that that i might have missed the original the original tweet but i think that that notion that especially you know you, you talked about the way history is taught in America. I mean, hence the presidential campaign that's going on right now and a lot of the ignorance that's being bandied about. But the fact that, it, that you know, you as an Arab woman are directing not only a female superhero, but, you know, the, the name of your episode, I believe, is Truth, Justice, in the American Way, right? Like, it's such an iconic superhero as, as Supergirl. I think it's, it's the, 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 the photo itself and the idea itself just speaks volumes, I think. And, you know, for us, and you know this, you know, as... There is certain milestones that, you know, um, every minority group, every ethnic group has. And, um, you know, you know, look, for example, talking about Iron, Iron Fist, for example, that we always talk about is, <laughs> you know, having an Asian Iron Fist instead of going with the Caucasian, you know, idea of the 70s and 80s that here's this white guy in this Asian world is, is a milestone that I know the Asian community would celebrate, right? And for us, for Arabs and Middle Eastern people, we we barely we barely on screen. We don't even come up in the conversations about right. missing minority group. We 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 don't even get close to like oh maybe it should be an Arab in this role. And so you know, the, Saladin picked this up. I didn't even pick this up. The idea of this whole super girl is so iconic American, and this the world between iconic American and Middle Eastern, you know, is so conflicted right now. Right. Um, that that picture to him really meant a lot, which is why it got retweeted seven hundred times or how many times. Right. Right. And in. And that's when you realize as somebody who's doing this that I, I hadn't thought about that before at all. I was thinking of women, to be honest, of women power and women fight. I hadn't thought of it from his perspective, but I realized in how many people retweeted it, how much it meant to the Arab community. That's the beautiful thing about intersectionality, right? Right. And then, and, and you know, unfortunately, that's, that's you know, those intersections often get do get ignored. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned Iron Fist because, you know, we have been talking about this resurgence of, of superheroes on television and, and TV being the place where these superheroes get to be more diverse and get to, to get to represent more than just, you know, the, what the, what the Avengers movies represent where it's, where it's mainly white, white dudes, um, you know, on TV, you have Supergirl, but you also have Agent Carter and Jessica Jones being representing for women. Um, Netflix has, you know, Daredevil, this is the new season. Daredevil is going to have a Punisher, which is a character you're familiar with, but also Elektra being played by an Asian woman, which is, which is actually, they're halfway there about recasting right. traditionally white characters as people of color. Um, and, and of course, Iron Fist coming, you know, since last we talked, I believe there's been a lot more progress, quote unquote, on the Iron Fist front. They've named a, sh a showrunner and, um, you know, they're still up in the air about who they're casting 
you know how I feel and I know how you feel about who should be uh, the, the lead, uh, Danny Rand. Have you heard any, I mean, maybe you have and you can't talk about, but are the, have you heard any buzz about where Iron Fist is going? No, I would talk about it. That's not something I could keep a secret. And frankly, <laughs> nobody tells me anything because of that. Like I've actually tried to find it out from the, the woman who's the production designer right now for Luke Cage is a woman named Toni Barton, which people should talk about. She will never do press for herself, but she's an amazing, talented black woman who's, who's worked as an art director on Jessica Jones and, and Daredevil. And now she's become a production designer alone for Luke Cage because the production designer of or that she worked for has moved on already to Iron Fist. Like that's already being prepped. And it's already, it seems clear that there will be a Punisher show. So, you know, I think there's a lot going on. And I also read somewhere that 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 uh, Iron Fist is cast, that they're just not wanting to let us know. Now, I I mean, I tried as hard as I could, but they, they won't tell me. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't have great hopes. I don't think, you know, the level of where, what we, it's, it's very unfortunate because the level of, diversity and inclusion and equality that we're talking about is still too sophisticated for some people to comprehend you know for them and i've seen this even a lot of like nerds of color that may not necessarily be our group of nerds of color but you know a lot of blurts you know a lot of like there was a lot of pushback on this Asian Danny Rand, even from our people. Oh yeah, and, trust me, and, I, I, I received a, a, a good report. I know, I saw all of you, yeah, I saw all of you getting into arguments, I saw my friend Rebecca getting into arguments. And, you know, when that's the case, when even a black nerd can't understand why Asians want an Asian, you know, iron fist, um, you know, how are we ever going to expect you know, white people to understand it. It's unfortunate because obviously you and I understand so clearly why it's the right choice. And, you know, sometimes it reminds me this whole inclusion and diversity thing is like speaking a foreign language. And me, me being someone who speaks several, I know the process of it is, you know, you're at a place where you barely speak, then you somewhat fluent, and then you really fluent. And, you know, I feel like there's a certain, there's so many levels of diversity. Most people think, oh, I'm so diverse in inclusion, and you're not even fluent, you're not even close. Right. You don't speak the language at all. And so what we're talking about is understanding it fluently, you know, like understanding the feeling and the culture and the work. And they're not there. And I mean, boy, it would surprise me if it was an Asian actor. And certainly it would please me, but it would really surprise me because I, don't, I just don't think they're there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been hearing the same thing soon. And, and not even just like rumors, but just gut instinct telling me that especially once they've named, they named their showrunner. And, and, you know, part of the reason why we were making so much noise that we were a few months back was because after Scott Buck was named the showrunner, I was hearing under, through the grapevine that, that they were leaning heavily towards casting a white actor. And, you know, part of it, I'm kind of, kind of at this point resigned to the, to the fact, but I think what you're saying is absolutely right. The, 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 the idea that we even have to convince ourselves, and it, it goes beyond just, you know, other nerds of color. I mean, other Asian American people aren't necessarily on board with the idea of an Asian American art. The, the whole fear of like the martial arts stereotype, it, it plays a big part in that. And, and, you know, what's interesting is you being a martial artist and me, someone, you know, we've, and we've talked about this in the past, the martial arts itself is not the problem with the stereotype. The problem with the stereotype is this idea that Asians can't be anything else. And, and this was an opportunity for that to happen. That said, being an, a, a martial artist, I think the only the only saving grace that Iron Fist would have for me if they do cast a, a non-Asian person in the lead role is to get you to be a director for one of the episodes. So let's keep our fingers crossed that that would happen because oh. you could still kick you it. Know, and I, I feel so um, conflicted about that because, you know, obviously I've been outspoken about the fact that mm -hmm. I would like to have an Asian actor. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating to me because I feel like in 50 years from now, this is going to go down in history books like, oh, they didn't get that. That was a really bad choice to do the white <laughs> guy in the Asian world again, you know. And it's so clear to me that it's almost, it's very conflicting. But, you know, I mean, it, you know, the, the Marvel thing is an interesting thing because here I am now, I've done two DC shows, um, you know, 
it's it's I certainly would like to dive into the Marvel world, but it hasn't happened yet, you know. Well, you know, I mean, I, I believe you said Luke Cage has already finished um, filming because they've moved on to Iron Fist now, and, and Luke Cage, I believe, is still. No, they are in the middle of filming. I was actually they they just started their episode, but oh. I think because Iron Fist is starting already while while Luke Cage is still in the middle of shooting that's why they had to like create more jobs and more camps but Luke Cage just started shooting and I was actually up for an episode but I didn't okay. get so I must have lost to somebody who's better than me which by the way totally happens uh, you know I'm excited who's better than Lexi Alexander nobody's better than Lexi Alexander. I'm excited to see who it is you know um I'm going to look at every single resume of every single episode and see who beat me here. <laughs> well, if we're going to put this out on the internet that Lexi Alexander was up for Luke Cage and didn't get it. So, you, you know, you're going to have all your internet backers coming out in full force. I'm pretty yes, sure. Yes, the nerds of like, colors must investigate. <laughs> but I'm sure somebody who was much better and had more experience beat me to it. And that's, that's okay. You know. Well, you know, that's, I would... You know, I like I said, I would still, I still think, how, however they cast uh, the lead in Iron Fist, you would still be the best option when it comes to at least directing one or two episodes because you know, I mean, your just your background alone. Although I, I think, like you said, your 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 outspokenness might might uh, behoove you from <laughs> from getting that part. But other than other than Iron Fist or Luke Cage or even Jessica Jones, are there other superheroes that you kind of have your eye on or do you feel like you're, you're ready to move on to other genres? Because I believe you're in New York City right now prepping a different kind of show, right? Yeah, I'm prepping Limitless, which the people are just lovely here. I mean, I'm telling you, the people in, in TV are so much better than in movies. I like, you know, I tried to explain it to somebody the other day. They were asking me if I would do a movie again. And I'm now actually getting quite a few movie offers. And, you know, whenever people offer movies to me, it's like you're telling me, okay, we're now allowing you into the football team's locker room. You are now allowed to be the woman in, in like it's it's not a nice environment to be in the football team's locker room with the you know whistling and the sexes and like the, to me that's like what are you offering me you know mm. it's not even like let me get in the gate it's never been nice and therefore women it's probably also not been nice for any people of color but like i'm telling you as a woman especially in 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 the feature world there's something that they have established in their head that we just don't fit there. And it is like walking into an American football team's locker room. Like it feels like you're not, you're not welcome and you're not, you don't quite fit. And it's weird for them to have you there. And I don't know why it's such a male dominated environment and why they think it has to be. But in TV, I mean, I really have to say like people really treat me with respect and like genuine excitement that I take a job. And um, I'm also excited that Limitless was something that was offered to me because it doesn't, it is the whole, the, there was actually a funny moment today where I met the stunt guy who introduced himself and said, I'm the stunt guy. And um, I said, do we have anything? He's like, nope. And you know, for me, like to have no stunt whatsoever was like a massive compliment. And for him, it was rather sad that he didn't have something to work with me. <laughs> Because he really wanted to work uh, some kind of fight scene with me. But there's nothing on this whole show that, that is done. So it means that people hire me for other things other yeah. than sitting here. But in general, in terms of the scripts I get and the meetings I have, I'm still very much the go-to person for anything superhero and action related. Well, you know, it's, we, I think we, we mentioned this when you were on last time before Arrow. I, the, the interesting thing about that episode that you did was that it was probably like the least action heavy era episode of the season. In fact, um, I, I had mentioned that the the scene with Paul Blackthorne as as Captain Lance was was really emotional and dramatic and it kind of showed your chops as a director kind of eliciting that kind of emotion. Well, you know, that gets lost and I always have to re, re remind people that it gets lost in the whole you know, and it's another slightly biased thing that people assume women don't know about action. So the big story about me, even mm. the people who love me, is 
you know, oh, Lexi, she's a former stunt woman and a world kickboxing champion. And, you know, she can do action really well, as if that's like, you know, a big, big unicorn thing, you know. Okay. <laughs> and, but, you know, I go with it because I'm glad I'm working. So I'm just letting it letting it go. Um, but I have to remind people that I actually went to an incredibly difficult drama school. I studied right. Meissner and Stanislavski, probably more than most most of the, the people who do drama TV. And so consistently, every showrunner will say, but I'm really surprised you did all the acting. So, <laughs> so you know, what can I say? I mean, at some point, people will know. But it's good to be, you know, to know both sides of the coin. Well, you know, and I, I know I wanted to move on to, to other non-superhero shows, but that kind of brings me back to Supergirl in a way that I know that when the when the show was first announced and when I think they had their sizzle reel come out in the summer before the show debuted, it actually got a lot of criticism from people because it kind of, you know, they thought it played up the romantic comedy aspect and, and you know, it was too girly. I even wrote a post on the Nerds of Color about, you know, quoting, quoting Calissa Flockhart's line about, like, what's wrong with being girly, right? Can you talk a little bit about that, the fact that that, Supergirl doesn't necessarily run away from its femininity, that it's both an action heavy show with superheroes and, you know, kick ass fight scenes, but it's also, you know, it still embraces the feminine. So can you, can you talk about the balance on, well, this, you know, on the this show? This is like what's so weird is this whole idea that all of a sudden, if we need female heroes or female superheroes, that somehow they have to be the guy. I mean, how does that not go straight? It's like, it's like we, you know, if we're casting an Asian actor, but we 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 must make sure he acts white. It's what right. bothers me about uh, Mr. Robot. You know, it's like, look, I love the fact that an Egyptian one. I had a big crying moment. Arab Twitter went out of its mind. But my my good friend Amir Talal wrote wrote a, wrote a blog post about that about the danger of brown actors playing white. Mm. You know, it's that thing like can we only be like it always goes back to us being as much as white guys as possible. And with with uh, Supergirl, it goes to, you know, can she only succeed if she's like a dude? Because right. Think about it. If you look at Hunger Games, sh that was very much written like she's a guy. She sure. she's, she's the emotional, the, the the one that really has trouble showing emotions. She's the one that makes hard choices. The other guy she's in love with, or the, one of the love triangle guys, I can't remember his name, is really the one who's more emotional. So it's basically a reverse thing. But what what we made is, again, a white male hero because we wrote her like that and that's what surprises me and and i'm actually one of the women you know i i couldn't be more like a guy like i mean yeah. everything in my in, in terms of my history you know in terms of like you know what what i worked and what i do and the movies i make none of them pass the Bechdel test <laughs> you know does, does that does that you know what i don't tell people and i keep completely secret is things like i watched pretty woman 59 times <laughs> <laughs> Or dirty dancing. I did ballroom dancing. Like I mean, we're still women, you know. We still, um, and I, I, I don't know why this, this just doesn't help anything. It doesn't help to hire a person of color, or a, a, an actor of color, and make him act white. And it doesn't help us to, you know, have a show about a female superhero and make her not be feminine. It's weird, right. and it's going in the wrong direction. Let her be a girl. It's great. Right. And I feel like the, any kind of criticisms about, you know, that, that go in that direction. And again, this is something that I wrote in the Nerds of Color. It kind of, it makes it the default. You know, it reminds me of like when um, at, at uh, I think it was Christmas, and this was part of the post, and at Christmas time, the president uh, was sorting, you know, potential Christmas gifts for boys and girls. And it was it was a big deal that he was putting like, you know, basketballs and sports stuff in like the girls bin. And people were cheering, which is great, and I and I agree with that. And as someone who raises his daughter, my daughter loves science fiction and superheroes as much as the next kid. But I always felt like, but why is it only? It seems to only go one way. That it's awesome if girls act like boys, but it can't go the other way, right? Like it doesn't. Why? Why do we have to diminish femininity to celebrate girls? Does that make sense? Oh, I'm totally agree. We're still not at the point where 
you know, I have not seen a superhero, you know, bake or cook or be a single father or cry. Like we still, we still go back to this weird gendered way of how a dude has to be. And how I would totally love, you know, if, you know, God, I know so many single fathers who are in my eyes, absolute heroes who will have tea parties with their daughters. And I don't know why that's bad. And it's exactly what you said. It's actually the idea that anything considered feminine is bad is what right. makes women be second class uh, citizens. Exactly. We've got to get over that. First of all, what is feminine? Is the fact that I box and do martial arts masculine? Why? Why do we here still have gendered activities at all? This doesn't help anything. And Frankly, it's frustrating to me, and I don't know how we get people into the next century of this. You know, stop with the gendered, you know, ideas. You know. Well, you know, I'm, there's another Andrew Kreisberg, Greg Berlanti show that you haven't directed that actually features a superhero who cries and a single dad, and that's The Flash. So hopefully, uh, if Andrew Kreisberg is yeah. is watching this, they'll they'll give uh, Lexi uh, an opportunity to do The Flash too, so she can do the whole triumvirate of uh, DC. Shows. I agree. Do you know what we should talk about really quickly? Is that Vixen needs her own show, and I'm well, slightly like I'm really pushing for that because I feel that. There is some hesitance of giving a black woman a lead show, and I don't want that to be. This is the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, since I'm showing all of your um, Twitter pictures. Hashtag oh, yeah. woke Hollywood. You Brett, you mentioned Vixen. Megalyn Ek uh, was one of the, was one of the members of woke Hollywood. Can you talk about what the origin of this awesome you photo? You have is? to have Megalyn on your podcast because I, I would love to. I would love, I love to. I'm picking it up because I love her. I love her. I love her. Yeah, you know, there's there's a few of us who speak out, and and you know, it's and by by a few of us who I mean, people who actually have to constantly deal with executives and showrunners who are actually currently on shows, where the risk of, of speaking out is really tremendous, and I felt like you know we need to get together because it's it's very hard to deal with this in a vacuum and it's much easier when you have other people because sometimes an issue will come up to me that may not be as difficult for you know kirk who's one of the writers on american crime to speak about or amir or you know we call him our token white guy <laughs> Matt McClory, um, who is lovely but you know who certainly no, I mean, he knows it has the privilege of being a white man, but also he he also knows that he speaks about things that sometimes he's up for jobs with very macho old Hollywood old boy club people where he thinks and I believe him completely that he either could lose it or has already lost work because people have checked his social media uh, media. So I, we're all in the same boat and that's you know, we arranged this dinner to talk about it. We're going to try to have it again. But, you know, Megalyn, I didn't get to talk to her enough about Vixen itself, but I know that she has an episode coming up on Arrow. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely be watching that. But I feel like there's an apprehension, like there's a, we're testing it out. Whereas I think that would it be any other hero and not a black woman, it would already be in the works to be its own show. And I don't want that to be, I don't, I feel like we're ready for, you know, I, I, there shouldn't be a discussion. There shouldn't be a discussion about it. We, we are completely ready for a female. She's, first of all, the whole restaurant stops talking when she walks in. That's how stunning. <laughs> and she's super smart and super lovely. She's put in the work. She's a great actress. You know, I think we need that show. And I'm dead serious. I'm going to be upset if we don't get that show. Well, here's hoping because I know that, you know, from the animated micro series that was on the web that begat her appearance, it's going to be on Arrow in a couple of weeks. So the logical extension of that would be to to give Vixen her own show or at the very least make her a main a main cast member on one of the shows that currently exists. But I'm with you. I think I think the animated show was only 30 minutes total and we need definitely more Vixen. So I feel like we need to, as nerds of color, we need to get more people uh you know, behind us in a big group and really organized because I feel like, you know, there's Oscars of white and black Twitter. And the one thing we haven't managed is organize as a group of all minority groups, you know, 
and I feel like I really want to make this happen for nerds of color. Like I feel like we in, in the genre business who are people of color, we need to really organize and get all together. You know, uh, blurts, nerds of color, Latinos, every, everybody, we need to become a group and we need to get behind the people we want to support because if we organize, we have a voice. We are so much stronger together. That's a really good, interesting point because I, I wonder this and, you know, I, I have a limited reach only being a person who writes about things on the internet, but how, 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 how could we band together to, to affect change in Hollywood? Because I know that, you know, the, the Oscar So White campaign really did, at least, you know, on the surface, try to change things. You know, the Academy made these quote unquote drastic steps to change their membership, which pissed off a lot of old white people, uh, which I guess is a good sign. Um, but but what what can we do as a, as a community as an as a as an internet community as a as a global community what can we do what are some steps that we can do other than you know, hashtags and you know writing like lengthy thing pieces like you know people should follow this the nerds of color you know um, this is the point where you flash in our <laughs> but but I do think that what we're not doing right now even Oscar so white has kind of build a division between groups like all of a sudden latinos said well we're not hashtag activists we're actually doing this and people got ups, up, offended because you know asians were not mentioned latinos were not mentioned mm. i never even said a word and by the way arabs don't even come up in the conversation about the groups that have been missing because right. people assume we're not we, we don't exist but there's like over three million of us that's a pretty big number you know um and by the way that's just a census number so i feel like there's we could be so much stronger if we unite and for for us to unite we also have to like understand intersectionality and that's again where like the 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 being fluent in the language of inclusion like for example you and i we didn't get upset because oscar so white focused on the black actors and black projects that were left out but some people got upset right. but you wouldn't get upset if you were educated about the issue because right. that has to do with the fact that number one uh, you know the black community has built a community that no other group has managed to establish on the internet we just a lot of our groups don't certainly arab twitter doesn't like stick together like that number two they had the projects that were actually exactly. ignored and that people found one white person on to nominate right like it had nothing to do with the fact of why we're not talking about asians or arabs or latinos we don't have projects right <laughs> There was no Asian or Latino creed or straight out of Compton this year. Exactly. That's the reason. But what are... keeps us from uniting? We would be so much stronger as if we just like if we if we just either I have this thing called hashtag Ink Twitter that I've been trying to get going, which stands for Inclusion Twitter, which a lot of people have already joined when we talk about something. But in terms of genre and in terms of like pushing for a show like Vixen. Let's just get behind nerds of color. And that means we're inviting everybody who basically is not white, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to join us in this cause. And even white allies can join. God knows we're not kicking anybody out. Matt McGorry can be an honorary uh, nerd of color because yeah. he's such an ally. So it's not like we're exclusive, but this is a cause for us. And, you, you know, there's this famous picture of the fish, like the little fish will die, but the fish in a mob of fish can make a bigger fish, you know? And so we have to think about that, that organizing helps us. I am, I am hundred percent with you. And one of the, one of the, you know, um, kind of like uplifting things about the whole hashtag AA Iron Fist that, that happened a few, few months back. Sometimes you do feel like you're alone in the, in the void and you're the only voice that's out there, but to have, all these other accounts start chiming in and retweeting and it, it, it bubbled up beyond just like the nerds of color right and it it got to it got to the higher ups and i've heard from independent sources that people at marvel were even like oh what about the asian guy like it was even a consideration and, you know hollywood reporter reported about that so and it was because of the you know like you said that unified voice and it wasn't just like some guy hashtagging and, and yelling and, and you know in a, in a basement somewhere but it was this collective movement of people because i think the hash the thing about hashtag activism is there's nothing wrong with it but it's the it's the clarion call it's not the last step right it's the it's right. what brings everyone together and then you have to m motivate people but then act on that beyond just the hashtag and i think you know we we are in, in an interesting age where we are so connected because of social media but at the same time 
we're also disconnected in a way. And I feel like there is, there is a way to kind of like close that gap. I agree. But, you know, we're not using, for, social media has given us a microphone, the marginalized people. We never had a soapbox or a microphone. We have one now. Let's use it the right way. And you're right. The, the thing about, uh, you know, Asian Iron Fist was for the first time, not for the first time, but we saw that, you know, you know, black activists stood for it, Arab activists stood for it. So this is what we can do for every cause. We're just mm. stronger as nerds of color than, than we are as blurs or nerds, you know? Well, I, again, I'm going to put that on a quote on the website. Lexi Alexander says, follow nerds of color. So <laughs> I agree. And, and definitely we all have to live tweet uh, Supergirl on the 22nd because we're up against, I think, the finale of the X-Files. Mm. Well, we we are definitely going to be there live tweeting, uh, at least the West Coast. We okay. might even make an exception next week and do both the East Coast and the West Yay! Coast feeds because, you know, we'll, we'll do that for you, Lexi. But yeah, we Supergirl is definitely on the live tweet agenda. Um, I want to thank you, Lexi, for, for coming back and, and talking with us about all things Anytime. Not just Supergirl. My podcast, I told you. I'm not a yeah. guest. <laughs> You're not a guest. You're not a guest. You are going to be the co-host going forward every time we do a yeah. show. We're not a, the, you the, actually definitely have Megalyn on. I'm gonna arrange that. I will hold you to that because I okay. would love I would love to have that happen. Um, Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do that. Let's have Megalyn on. We can talk about Vixen and we can just talk more about hashtag woke Hollywood. Yay! Sounds good. And thank you for watching the Nerds of Color. We will be back again next time. Thank you. Bye for Kind. More like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different line. The kids who share the interest together with a similar kind. When they said John Glover for Spider Man, they didn't mind. The activists, directors, comments, and the lectures. Fanboys, professional artists, and professors. Maybe a nerd who's just like you, talking about the things that you like too. So I invite you to the NOC.